video icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the live stream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila live stream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. The webinar will begin in 10 minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the New Sigma Phi Sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the New Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM live stream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. 
To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. The webinar will begin in five minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, 
the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. Good morning everyone, I'm Dr. Sheena C, U Sigma Phi Sorority Batch 2012, speaking in behalf of the Aging and Longevity Webinars team of the New Sigma Phi Sorority. We are streaming live from the video conference room of the UB Manila Information Management Service. Our time in Manila is now exactly 12 noon. For today's webinar, we are privileged to have a distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine class 1987. She finished her dermatology residency training in UPTGH in 1992 and was a chief resident of the department during her last year of training. She is an experienced clinician, educator, and leader in the field of dermatology, having served as former president of the Philippine Dermatological Society Southern Philippines chapter, and is currently the head of the section of dermatology in West Visaya State University Hospital. She is an active consultant at Iloilo Doctors Hospital and West Visaya State University Hospital. She is also a professorial lecturer at the Iloilo Doctors College of Medicine, and at West Visayas State University College of Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Eileen Montero, New Sigma Phi Sorority, Batch 1987. Good morning. Um, I am tasked today to discuss with you um, certain skin uh, findings on the aging skin. So to start, I have no disclosures for this uh, lecture. And our objectives for this morning would be to differentiate between chronologic and photoaging of the skin. We'll tackle um, the histolo histological changes that are found in aging skin. We'll discuss a little bit on the anti-aging skin treatments and we'll touch on common skin disorders of the elder gene. Now, um, we change as we go through life we're still the same person, but our um, physical appearance changes as seen from this uh, compiled photos of our own um, Gloria Diaz when she um, won as Miss Universe um, in 1969 and up to the, her picture now at present. So the skin undergoes changes with time and is and in response to environmental factors and hormonal influences. Very few patients die of old skin or succumb to skin failure. The importance is primarily psychological. Emotional impact of skin aging should not be underestimated. 
the, at, at birth, the skin is very flexible, but this is already a tough outer covering. The color is unblemished and wrinkle-free, and it has a smooth texture with good elastic tone. An aged skin, the, um, the skin becomes thinner, paler, drier, and it becomes more fragile. And it also usually develops few pigmented lesions on it. Photo-aged skin um, is different. Aside from the regular um, findings in uh, chronolo chronologically aged skin, we also see wrink wrinkling, blotchy pigmentation, and roughness. Sun-damaged skin is also less flexible and is most more easily bruised. This is a photo of the histological changes of uh, young skin versus um, the old skin. No? So we have... Uh, uh, the epidermis is thinner, and the um, flat there is flattening here of the um, epidermal dermal junction. And if you see the there is loss of elasticity, you see the broken down collagen over here compared with the nice color of the collagen in young skin. Collagenase is a protein which um, breaks down collagen. And this is a, a photo, immunohistolog immunohistological photos showing the presence of a lot of this um, collagenase in age skin. See here, intact collagen fibers in young skin, and you see fragmented collagen fibers in the, in the skin of the elderly, elderly. This is a photo of a fibroblast, which is very healthy in um, younger skin and look at the collapsed fibroblast in the old uh, or in the skin of uh, the el elderly now this photo shows the penetration of ultraviolet on the skin you see that your uva reaches up to the dermis this that da this damages the um, collagen adding to the uh, findings of aging uh, adding to the, what you call this, it, it makes the uh, aging process in the skin more prominent for people who are usually exposed to sunlight. Now here, another, another photo you, showing the um, skin which is exposed to uh, minimal erythema dose of your UVB. You see here, no UVB, no activity of your um, enzymes here you have a lot of um, collagenase enzyme activity. So with these effects of the UVA on the skin, you have these added effects on the skin um, caused by the damage of your ultraviolet. In intrinsic aging, you just usually have fine wrinkles, laxity of the skin. You have thinner skin with, fi with fine wrinkles. Maybe you're a little pale, but if you're always under the sunlight, you have this pigmentation, laxity. You have more wrinkles. Maybe you'll have more blood vessels showing on the skin, like telangic dictatia. Your skin becomes leathery in appearance, and you have increased possibility of cutaneous malignancies. Now, this photo shows um, a, a photo of twins. Now, one twin was not exposed to sunlight, and the other twin, because this, I think this photo was a nun, and this photo of the twin who was always sunbathing, you see they're both of the same age, but look at the younger looking skin on this um, photo, sun-protected um, skin. So this is just to reiterate that the sun actually really adds on to the aging process of the skin. Now, if you go to the department stores, you see a lot of anti-aging creams that are um, being sold. Every year, there's a new flavor. Sometimes it's uh, um, you don't you don't even know where this um, herbal agents that they put in the skin come from, but as Consumers, we need to be able to investigate and determine which of these anti-aging um, uh, creams available will work. And we should always um, think of how, this, how do these creams work to prevent or to um, ameliorate the appearance of aging. Sunscreens will treat the ultraviolet 
um, uh, will prevent the ultraviolet damage on the on the skin. Your antioxidants will take charge of the um, radical oxygen species. Your fillers will um, plump up the skin, increasing mechanical tension. And your retinoids will always um, will stimulate collagen so that your um, wrinkles will be minimal. So to prevent aging of the skin, we have to start young, to stay young. It's easier to prevent aging than to treat it. So sunscreens are really mandatory. They will provide um, protection against your ultraviolet. Now, we need a broad spectrum uh, sunscreen. We need, we need it to be effective against your UVA and your UVB. So when you, when you buy your sunscreens, you have to check that it, is, again, it should be broad spectrum. Now, this is just a photo of unilateral dermatochelosis, which is unilateral sun damage. This is a photo of a driver of a truck with no, um, what, uh, what do you call this, no UV protector on the window. So he is driving. So you see the aged skin on the side facing the window compared to the younger looking skin on the side, which is away from the window of the truck. This, again, just reiterates the importance of your ultraviolet um, sun protection, okay, for sun protection. Now, smoking impairs collagen formation. So as much as possible, stop smoking because smoking increases your meta metalloproteinases, which degrade collagen in the um, dermis. Now, this was a study um, or an article just recently released in August 1, uh, 2019, which um, studied the impact of smoking and alcohol use on facial aging in women. Um, this was a large multinational study, and there were around 3,000 um, subjects. And the results was that smoking was associated with increased severity of forehead and crow's feet and glabellar lines under eye puffiness, ear trough hollowing, nasolabial folds, oral commissures, and reduced lip fullness. Um, alcohol, heavy alcohol use was associated with increased upper facial lines and under eye puffiness, along with the more prominent oral commissures. So we can see that Smoking and alcohol consumption significantly but differently, differentially impact skin volume and, and uh, related uh, facial aging. Now, anti-aging treatments. We need diets rich in fiber, fruits, and vegetables. We need adequate sleep and water intake. Now, with regards to with regards to food, we need food, we need to consume food that is less inflammatory. Um, meat maybe once or twice uh, a week, we should consume more proteins. And um, in one of the um, conferences attended before, we should consume food that is colorful. The more colorful our food is, the better it is for your antioxidant levels. Now, this was another study um, regarding oral, supplement, oral su supplements and um, Skin, con skin, con skin connection, okay? So this was a study made um, uh, regarding a, an oral supplement that was um, being marketed for uh, a, uh, aging skin, okay? So this was a small study, 50 subjects, but you can see the, or the difference after, before and after the study, 12-week study of consuming oral supplements for the, um, against uh, skin aging. The contents of this um, uh, nutraceutical was um, a lot of, you have vitamin A, you have vitamin E, you have other trace elements like iodine, magnesium, and zinc, and you had also phyto, phytoestrogens, um, of, um, essential fatty acids in this supplement. So this just goes to show that um, eating right and drinking or taking the right supplement can greatly help the physical appearance of aging skin. 
we have a lot of anti-aging treatments uh, that are available. Some of them may be topical. Some of them may be procedures or even uh, laser, um, lasers or even surgical. But what we're going to do today is just limit our talk on the topical agents that we can use to preserve the, the, our skin. So in the market, this, um, these drugs or these um, substances that are used to preserve our skin are called cosmeceuticals. To define what is a cosmeceutical, we have to differentiate it from active drugs. A drug is intended um, for use in diagnosis, cure, mitigation, and treatment and prevention of disease. While a cosmetic is supposed to be rubbed, poured, sprinkled, sprayed on, or introduced into, otherwise, um, into the skin, but it should not alter the appearance of the skin. A cosmeceutical is an in-between um, product. They do contain biologically active ingredients. Some alter the structure and function of the skin and most undergo safety testing. Now, the big difference is that if it is a drug, it has to undergo a lot of tests before the drug can claim that it is um, effective. A cosmeceutical does not undergo such rigid process so that you have to really uh, uh, try to analyze the marketing strategies um, being, um, being used before you purchase a certain cosmetic. And you have to remember that ours is a market-driven society. So the goal for, for um, companies is just really to sell products. So... Among the, among the things or among the creams that really work in, the, uh, in cosmetics, retinoids really are still the gold standard. So to show, as shown here, this is a before picture, and this is an after picture of a patient that was placed on retinoids. What are retinoids? Retinoids are your vitamin A derivatives. They can be your retinol, um, which is found in cosmetics, or your tretinoin, which is... Um, it uh, considered as a drug. So here you can see the wrinkles before and after, and the nice um, the nice uh, deposition of your pro collagen after six months. But you see here, it, there's no miracle cure. You have to con continuously use the the sub the the product to get the effects. So this is baseline. And this is after six months. So what are the types of cosmeceutical agents? There's so many available in the market. And these are just a few of those that we see in the ingredient list of the products that we, that we buy. Okay, so we have vitamin E, coenzyme Q10, glutathione, vitamin C, niacinamide, so on and so forth. Okay. So how do these um, agents work? Well, they, are, they work through anti-inflammatory. They can be depigmenting. They can be a moisturizer. Or they can be um, peptides, which will also increase your um, collagen deposition. Or they can also contain growth factors. But the major questions that we need to ask before we buy are this. Is the active ingredient able to penetrate the skin and be delivered in sufficient concentrations to the intended target? Does the active ingredient have a known specific biochemical mechanism of action on the target cell or on the human skin? Are there published peer-reviewed double-blind placebo-controlled statistically significant clinical trials to substantiate the efficacy uh, claims? You see, in the, cosmetic, in the cosmetic world, every year they have to come up with a new product to entice people to buy their products. So these active ingredients are, are usually um, a herbal, you no know, comes from plants. So it may be from a coffee, it can be from a berry, like acai berry, so on and so forth. So can this active ingredient really penetrate the skin and work? 
So many clinical studies were were made no, to evaluate these um, cosmeceutical agents. And um, this review showed that usually the in cosmetics for acne, like uh, which contains salicylic acid, glycolic acids, this usually work. Okay. Ceramides or moisturizers, they, they usually work. Ascorbic acid, they do. Phosphatidylcholine, um, they do work for um, improvement of the skin. But if you look at the patient, number of patients involved in these studies, it's quite few, not 30, 10, 19, just to show that, that there is, um, that they made the study. So it's not the same number of patients that is required before a drug is approved. Um, however, among all of this, retinaldehyde, which is usually used in acne, has more, more subjects. That's why this vitamin A derivative has been proven to work. Okay. So other, other um, researches um, on, on herbals, not active ingredients against human epidermal aging, Another research was done on the impact of herbal products on the prevention, regeneration, and delay of skin aging has shown a number of products that have actually, in, in, which actually increase the, appear, the uh, collagen, which actually also decrease the inflammation that is found in aged skin. So all of these products, they do work. The main problem now is finding creams or cosmetics that have the correct um, concentration of these um, active ingredients. So how much do we really know about our favorite cosmet cosmeceutical agents? This is just a short review no? um, that was uh, in the Journal of Clinical and Aesthetic Dermatology. For example, retinoids, does it penetrate the skin? Yes, it does. Do we know how it works? Yes, we know it works. And does it show clinical significance? The, although there is limited data, it has really been shown to work, but it has to be used for a long time. Kinetin, there are, um, there are no actual studies if it penetrates. Yes, we do know how it works. And does it know, show clinical significance? Yes, it does. Niacinamide has very good studies. Uh, so soy isoflab isoflavones have um, limited data. There are no adequate studies, but it, it does work if it can penetrate the skin. So green tea, we have um, limited data if it penetrates the skin. There are no adequate human studies as of um, 2010. But yes, it does work to um, improve the appearance of the skin. So the conclusions of this article was that retinoids are the most effective um, uh, for um, as an anti-aging uh, cream. There's some evidence to support the use of retinaldehyde and retinaldehyde to decrease fine lines and wrinkles. Niacinamide was proven to be effective for anti-aging, but there's, there's a need for further studies. Um, for soy, Proteins, although there's a lot of research on antioxidant effects, the problem is that the clinical studies um, are less than 50 um, patients per study. Green tea shows it has an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity, but no clinical trials show significant clinical improvement on the signs of aging. So... Other, procedure, other procedures that can be used to promote um, youthful skin would be your chemical peels, your botulinum toxin, fillers, and your lasers. Now, that aside, what are the common skin disorders that we can find in the elderly? The most common, of, of, of course, would be your itching because of dry skin. Certain kinds of eczemas are also usually found in the um, elderly, like your stasis dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, and incontinence-associated dermatitis. Infections usually is more of candidiasis, especially for patients with, who have um, superimposed diabetes mellitus. You have also um, appearance of skin tumors, which may be benign or malignant, and some skin discolorations. This is just to show you the, 
skin in the elderly if they do not apply moisturizers you see very very dry skin that can crack and this once this crack cracks there is a possibility of secondary bacterial infection. Now, this is incontinence-associated dermatitis, especially for patients who are unbound um, to their beds. No? Seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff is more common in the elderly, and this is the appearance of the scalp, and even here on your nasolabial folds. Candidiasis usually found in the intertriginous areas. Common skin tumors, which are um, benign, are your seborrheic keratosis, which are brown um, papules on the skin, uh, found maybe even on the back or on the face. This is very common in people or in uh, of skin color like us Filipinos. Discolorations of the skin, your solar lentigo or your melasma, is found in the elderly. Malignant tumors like your actinic keratosis, especially for patients who have prolonged exposure to sunlight. Basal cell carcinoma and melanoma may also be found in the elderly. So how do we care for the skin? In our 20s, the skin is smooth, the coloring is even, there's very little need for moisturizers. Acne may be present, so they should be treated and your skin and your skin care should be uh, gentle cleansers. And of course, you have to use your sunscreen. In your 30s, the skin becomes too thin. You have um, fine wrinkles around the mouth and eyes. So you still have to use your sunscreen. You use your moisturizers with antioxidants. And you can start on your vitamin, topical vitamin A therapy. In your 40s, your skin becomes more sallow, less supple. You have more pigmented lesions. Lines appear even at rest. So you should use your sunscreens, um, use your retinoids, especially prescription drugs. You need a stronger um, retinoid to work. You can use your alpha hydroxy acids. You really have to use moisturizers with anti, um, a, uh, antioxidants and or your peptides. And you can do your office procedures like lasers or botulinum toxin. 50s, 60s, and 70s, the wrinkles are deeper. You have more sunspots. So you can use alpha hydroxy acids to smoothen the skin, promote skin renewal. You use your sunscreen. You use a more hydrating um, moisturizers. Use them at least twice a day. Your antioxidants, you use your prescription <clears throat> retinoids. And if you are really concerned, you can do laser procedures no? or fillers. So how do we keep on looking young? We need to dress age appropriately. We need to wear the right eyeglasses if we if you use eyeglasses so don't so you don't add um, years to your to your face. On makeup, less is always better. And you have to treat yourself better. You have to remember to smile. Because if you smile, that is already one of the more um, useful anti-aging things, anti-aging um, maneuvers that you can do. Remember that what matters most really is how you see yourself. So if you're happy looking at yourself in the mirror, you'll be happy for the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Montero, for that comprehensive talk. We now have 25 viewing through UP Manila live stream, 88 through YouTube live, and 422 through Facebook live, and group viewings from all over the Philippines. The floor is now open for questions from the audience. Just type in your questions at the Q&A chat box in the right lower corner of the live stream window or type in comments in the YouTube Live or FB at Aging Webinars for Facebook Live viewers. So, Doctora, I would like to ask um, a question that I think would benefit all the viewers. Um, when you talk about sunscreen, what is the appropriate SPF that we should look for and how to uh, apply it uh, correctly so that we can achieve the correct SPF? SPF is what we call the sun, sun protective factor. 
we the most um, when the when the companies are um, put the SPF number on their sunscreens, it undergoes a um, regulated test. Okay, so um, SPF thirty for me would be should be the very minimum. Why is it? When these companies mark their SPF as 50 or as 30 or as 15, there is a required amount of sunscreen that you're supposed to apply on a specific area of the skin. And how do you translate it to uh, regular use? It's around 2.5 ml or half a teaspoon for the face. So if you have a, a sunscreen and you and you use 2.5 ml on the on the face you will appear very very white okay? and we don't we don't want that so for women usually i advise a tinted sunscreen so that um, when you apply it looks more um uh, uh what you call this it blends with your skin and um, if you do not apply this 2.5 ml or half a teaspoon on the face, you just apply a very thin amount. Even if your SPF um, is, even if the SPF of your sunscreen is 50, maybe it will just be equivalent to SPF 10. Mm. So you need a specific amount. That's why the higher you go, the better. So that if your sunscreen is more as a stronger SPF, even if you apply a little bit, maybe it will become SPF 15. And um, studies have, it has been, um, what it was recommended, that you're not supposed to put an SPF of 100 or an SPF of 80 or even beyond 50. Because actually the difference between an SPF 50 maybe and an SPF 30 maybe would be 5%. Five, 5%. There abouts, yeah, maybe there about five percent, and there's no one hundred percent SPF. The only hundred percent SPF available is with you if you're inside the room, you're under the under the blanket in your bed, no sun exposure. That is one hundred percent SPF. So related to that, we have another question from the viewer: um, Do oral sunblock capsules such as beta carotene work? Uh, as of now, there is one. Um, capsule that has shown um, that studies have shown to work, and these capsules have poly poly oh my gosh polypodium polypodium locomotus um, uh, plant derived um, uh, sunscreen, and that one has a a lot of studies on it, and it's it works. You have to take it um, at least five days before your sun, sun um, your let's say you go to the beach, you have to take it at least five days before you go, and every day, of course, um, on, when you're in the beach. But again, it works, but there's no total protection. So you still need to use your topical sunscreens. And if you're in the beach, you're supposed to, even if it's say, it said there it's um, waterproof, just apply it every hour if you can, because exposure to sunlight, water, sweating, it all um, dissolves your um, sunscreens. And then from another viewer, um, the question is, does kojic acid as a whitening agent have uh, systemic side effects when used as a soap or a cleanser? When you use, when you use a soap as, or cleanser as a method for um, applying something on, on the skin, you have to remember that you wash it off. So there's a contact period. So you you apply the soap, maybe after a minute, you wash it off. So there, there will be very, very minimal absorption, okay, System, or systemic effect. But kochic acid, it does work, especially in the cream form and especially applied on specific um, hyperpigmented or uh, hyperpigmented um, areas. You don't, we don't want to whiten our entire skin because remember, our melanin serves a purpose. The melanin protects the nucleus of the of the keratinocyte from sun damage. So it has been shown that when you expose your skin to sunlight, the melanin granules inside the cell, they actually move to cover to cover the nucleus so that when the rays of the UVA 
enter the skin, it's reflected off your melanin granules. So if you try to decrease the number of melanin granules on your skin, uh, on your normal skin, then you will have more UVA going into your, into your nucleus, damaging the DNA, and will make you more prone to develop skin cancers in the future. Mm. Okay, ma'am. Uh, this one is from Doc Manny. He's asking, what is the advantageous effect of astaxanthins on normal skin? Astaxanthins? Yeah, I haven't heard of that also. Um, I haven't heard of that. There's so, um, there's so many um, herbal uh, ingredients right now in the market. And a lot of research has been shown that most of them, most of them, they, they do work. It's just that we do not have the exact... Um, concentration that we need on the skin so that we will see its um, effects. So if you don't know it, we just have to eat health, healthy and consume it in our diet. Okay. Um, we have two questions related to the use of retinoids. Um, the mm -hmm. first one is asking how long should you take or maybe apply, apply. the retinoids? And the second one is uh, um, asking which, uh, which formation is actually more effective um, retinoin or adapalene for photo aging, and at what percentages? Okay, um, adapalene also is a is a retinoid. Um, the concentration of adapalene for um, anti aging is higher than what is being used for uh, um, acne. Okay, so we use the higher concentration, which is I I think point point zero three. 0.03 or point zero three or 0.03 is the higher because the regular is point um, point zero one. Now for for um, tretinoin, um, even point zero two five has effects. The problem with tretinoin is that it causes irritation on the skin. So for younger individuals, you can use the cosmetic form, which would be your retinol or your retinaldehyde, which is um, on the concentration of, I think, around 0.04%. So how long should you use this? Um, to see effects, as shown in the study, you need around six months, and you maintain it. Because aging is a continuous process. The minute you stop, then the regular process of the de um, degradation of your collagen will, will restart. So you need it as a maintenance. And regarding that, um, Dr. Chi Garcia sent in a question. If you can comment on bakushiol, which is a relatively new active ingredient versus retinol, and which is more effective between the two. Um, there's no, um, I haven't seen a study um, doing a back-to-back uh, -back, uh, comparison uh, between the two. But um, all the um, journals that I have checked recently, it's still um, vitamin A, topical form, retinol, retinaldehyde, or tretinoin, which, is, which serves as the gold standard for anti-aging treatment. So usually when you have studies, they usually compare it to this because this has been the most um, studied and the most effective. Okay. And then the next question, ma'am, is regarding moisturizers. Mm -hmm. So... What should we look for in moisturizers, especially in our hot and humid climate in the Philippines? Oh, <laughs> this is a very, um, uh, what you call this, case-to-case -case basis because there are several um, several um, patients or some people, they don't like the sticky feeling of moisturizers on their, on their skin. The most important thing to, to check for moisturizers is that it should be non-irritating, should have no perfumes, and um, should have active ingredients that really work. What are the active ingredients that really work? So if you can find a moisturizer that has ceramide in it, that will, um, that will, uh, that will help. Um, for, for facial moisturizers, what um, we need to, to do is you need to check a very, since we don't want heavy moisturizers in our, in our, um, 
temp, uh, what you call it, in our country because it's really sticky and you begin to feel hot. You you use the moisturizers that are lightweight, um, more 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 what you call these water molecules. You don't use the oily oil oil based moisturizers. And when you use your moisturizers, you have to see that. It has antioxidants, so not just moisturizing your skin, but also treating the inflammation that is um, that uh, is happening in the skin. Because as we go through our daily lives, we're not just we're also exposed to the um, pollutants in the environment, and we need something anti-inflammatory to treat this. Okay, uh, regarding antioxidants um, or vitamins that you mm-hmm. can apply topically, which among those vitamins do you recommend? Vitamin C. Vitamin C has the most studies. But you also, again, vitamin C is a um, chemical that is very, very fragile. So if you see vitamin C being sold to you in a clear bottle, that's not vitamin C. Because vitamin C exposed to sunlight degrades. So this vitamin C usually should be in um, these amber-colored bottles and should be on the L ascorbic form because that's the form that is um, absorbed easily by the skin. From another viewer, uh, she's asking if you can apply both vitamin C serum and retinol together at night. Yes, you can apply both. And there are even some formulations that have um, ferulic acid uh, together with your vitamin C. They, they do formulate that it's not just vitamin C alone. But um, other other important uh, uh, what we call these chemicals that can improve the appearance of the skin. Okay. Um, regarding sun exposure, I, um, they are asking about what is the appropriate amount of vitamin D exposure um, that the patient, the person should should get, ha- should, should get. Yes, in a day. Um, at our age, we rarely go out under the sun. We're usually in our offices or in our houses. So we don't, have, when we we have, uh, we have use our jackets, so we don't usually um, have enough um, sun exposure for the um, vitamin D production. So that's why in some of the journals um, that I have read, it is recommended that one of the things that we, we really need to take would be vitamin D supplements. Vitamin vitamin D supplements, not for because we we're not we don't uh, expose ourselves um, for enough time under under the sun. So vitamin D supplements is a is a must because remember the sun the sun is 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 good but it really causes a lot of damage on the skin and it accumulates. Now, since you were born up to the present, the damage is accumulated. So the less sun exposure that you do, the better looking your skin will be. But again, that is a personal choice because if you if you're happy swimming, if you're happy doing outdoor stuff, go ahead, do, do that. Just use your sunscreen because in your in that case, the most important thing to do uh, that we're concerned about is to prevent the appearance of skin cancer. That's true. Mm-hmm. The appearance of skin cancer, not the aesthetic uh, appearance of the skin. So if you're happy with outdoor activities, go for it. Just use your sunscreen because we do not want you to develop skin cancers. Um, there's a question related to glutathione. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> They're asking if um, will, is glutathione harmful or beneficial for, for us. For us. Uh, okay. Um, I have to take this opportunity to remind the audience that um, under our bu- um, National Bureau of Food and Drug Administration, IV glutathione is not legal. It is not approved by the Bureau of Food and Drug Administration. IV glutathione is only used to treat um, persons with, like, for example, if a person has uh, undergoes chemotherapy and really needs to have a rescue, antioxidant rescue, then we, we can give your IV glutathione. But IV glutathione for skin whitening is not approved at all. Okay, so that's a disclaimer. 
Number two, glutathione is a very, very good antioxidant, but it has to be taken at the right amount. Anything that is super dosed, even vitamin D, um, uh, vitamin C, uh, mega doses of vitamin C, mega doses of vitamin D, or even mega doses of glutathione, is not good for the body. These antioxidants, they work. Um, together, like vitamin C has to work together with your glutathione, has to work together with your vitamin E. So it has to be given in the right amount. So if you give like glutathione in very, very high amount, it's not going to be an antioxidant. It will already become an oxidant. Okay, just like your vitamin C, most people say it's so water soluble, it will just pass it out through the urine. But that's not the case because there was this article on mega doses of vitamin B, vitamin C, so on and so forth. And it shows that it has mega doses have a deleterious effect on the on the body. So we just need to take the right amount. And you know, if you want to drink your vitamins, usually the multivitamins that's that works already or from the diet. It's like a- or yes, better from the everything is always better from the diet. Um, another viewer is asking if you can comment on facial yoga. Facial yoga for prevention of wrinkles. I've heard of <laughs> acupuncture. Uh-huh. To- yes. There's so many things that have not yet been studied. So that being said, it doesn't mean that it will not help because um, there are so many things that have to be discovered. So I have not read anything on um, facial yoga. Wrinkling on the face is usually um, because of the movement, because when you smile, you have these uh, wrinkles here, or when you um, frown, then you develop the, the wrinkles here. So um, if you don't have any facial expression, then you actually will not have, <laughs> will not have any, any wrinkles. Because remember, in chronologic aging, the wrinkle that is being formed on the skin would be this, not your nasolabial fold, because you lose the fat here. So your, your skin sort of droops. So this will be the chronologic aging uh, wrinkle that you will see. But the lines here, the lines on the forehead, and this is all facial, um, all because of the movement of your facial muscles. So um, facial yoga, <laughs> no comment. I have no <laughs> experience with that. Uh, another viewer is asking if, like, if you predominantly sleep on one side, yes, it will it will affect because remember you sleep for seven to eight hours. If you predominantly sleep on one side, and this will um, make your nasolabial fold more prominent on on that side. So even like wrinkling, you know. Um, so if you look. At, if you're watching TV or if you're reading and if your friend tells you, you know, you're unconsciously frowning, that is actually going to make your wrinkles on your forehead deeper. So if you put something here physically that will remind you not to frown, that will actually prevent the wrinkle in your glabellar area from developing. That is for your unconscious um, facial expressions. Um, another viewer is asking them, which one is better for wrinkles, chemical peeling or laser resurfacing? Uh, again, um, we usually do lasers for um, deeper or more prominent um, lines. If your lines are finer, you can get away with um, chemical peeling. The difference there, of course, would be the um, price of both procedures. Uh, it would depend on the capacity of the of the patient, how much the patient is willing to to fork out to um, uh, control the or improve the appearance of, of the face. But yes, your chemical peels they do they do work, especially for fine lines. It's good to hear. Um, a lot of our viewers are students or they commute to work, they commute mm-hmm. to school. So they're asking, um, is there a way to make sunscreen less sticky or more absorbable so that when they go on commutes, it's not uh, going to be... So when you're, when you're commuting um, and you're using a very um, strong sunscreen and it's very creamy, yes, your face really feels... Um, Dirty, you know, once you get uh, to your to the place that you're going to, so you can try to use the 
check the counters and try to look for sun sunscreens in the gel form because they're they're less oily and they can um, um, help you or make you feel better when you when you apply them. Just remember that, especially if you're commuting and you already uh, perspired a lot, you have to reapply your sunscreen. Because your sunscreen um, on, on, the, on the face usually will give you good effects for maybe three to four hours only. Even if it's an SPF 40 or a 50, only three to four hours, then you, then you lose the effect. So you have to reapply after three to four hours. And I think that also answers, uh, what you said, ma'am, answers mm -hmm. one of the questions on how many times or after, how many hours do you need to reapply? Three after? to four, yeah, every three to four hours. So for, for example, you go to the office and you're just in the office the entire day, then you don't really need to, to reapply. But if you go, go in and out of the office, then you perspire, you need to apply um, maybe every three, every three to uh, four hours. But you also have to remember, if you're just using a sunscreen just to prevent UVA, um, that's 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 good. That's already good enough. But if you're using a sunscreen um, because you want to to treat the uh, what you call this the a hyperpigmented patch, like you have melasma, and you want you're using the sunscreen to to check not to prevent the worsening of your melasma then you really have to use a more or a prescript or a doctor prescribed sunscreen not for for better um, effect and uh, you also especially if you're in the office or if you're fond of reading not reading at night using a um, night lamp mm -hmm. um, the uv of the <laughs> there's already a study showing that the uv of our lights can um, increase also the um, degree of pigmentation on the on the on the skin. Thanks so yes, that has your UV can affect. But oh. this one is LED. So it's okay. Yeah, that one is that one I think is okay. How about ma'am? Mm. Um, another question is uh, regarding umbrellas with UV protection. Uh, umbrellas with UV protection. Um, yes, it will help, but. The, the thing is you have to not limit or you have to open your 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 mind no so you're you're holding an umbrella um but you're under the sun the sun's rays reflect on the cement or if you're in the beach it reflects on the sand so reflection on the sand maybe it would be a maybe 80% of the UV is reflected on your on your face so you really so even if you're just um, what you call this, um, walking in the street and you have, if you have no problems, then fine, your your UV and your umbrella will work. But if you have um, skin pigmentation problems like melasma, which is really triggered by exposure to sunlight, I would suggest that you have your umbrella, you have your UV and you get your fan or you get your handkerchief and cover so that there's really no sun going to the pigmented area because we're, you're trying to lighten that area. There's no perfect sunscreen, okay? So there's no perfect sunscreen. So if you have pigmentary problems, you have to really prevent exposure to sunlight. So we have time enough for one last question um, from Dr. Wei. For people with sensitive skin, what ingredients do you need to avoid in cosmetic products? Wow, uh, sensitive skin, perfumes, um, col colored co um, pigment pigments in the um, uh, on the on the creams. You need to avoid. Um, it depends. No um, retinols. Sometimes is enough to to trigger reactions, or sometimes your alpha hydroxy acids will also trigger um, what you call this um, reactions on the skin. So when you buy something and you have sensitive skin, do not apply to the entire face immediately. Just apply on a certain area for maybe a week, so that if you have um, problems, we can just treat a small area and not the entire face. So thank you all for all those questions. And once again, thank you, Dr. Montero, for enlightening us with your answers. So in summary, um, we learned from the webinars um, today, from the webinar today, that our skin naturally breaks down over time and chronic UV exposure compounds the process. Mm -hmm. That's why dermatologists cannot emphasize enough uh, sun avoidance and proper use of sunscreen um, as young as possible. 
Careful skin examination in the elderly is needed to distinguish between benign lesions such as severe keratosis and pre-malignant and malignant lesions that occur more frequently in the elderly. And lastly, uh, skin skincare practices should be age appropriate and should address the skin needs of the patients. Sun protection and healthy lifestyle should be practiced by everyone. Among the cosmeceuticals, prescription strength retinoids are the most studies are the most studied and with the best available evidence uh, for anti-aging. We would like uh, with that, we would like to thank Dr. Eileen Montero for taking the time out of her beauty, uh, busy schedule, <laughs> beauty busy schedule, of course, <laughs> and sharing her expertise with us today. Uh, we would like to acknowledge our sponsor for this webinar, BMV Hypoallergenics. Please join us again on October 25, Friday, for Pneumonia in the Elderly by Dr. Anna York Bondo. Please also join the UP Web Med webinars every Wednesday. The Aging and Longevity Medical Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority would like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. We are also grateful to support from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, UP Manila Information Management Service, and DOST ASTI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we thank you, our participants, for spending your lunch hour with us. To receive your certificates of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation through the link that will be sent to your email addresses after you sign the attendance sheet for today's webinar. The certificates will then be emailed to your registered email addresses within two to four weeks. Here is a quick view of the schedule of our upcoming webinars. For more details and updates, please check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash agingwebinars and our Twitter timeline at twitter.com slash agingwebinars. Today's webinar recording and all webinar recordings may be viewed at YouTube at Aging Webinars channel. We are also announcing the launch of the OB Pearls book. Get your copies now. Thank you and have a great day.